Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I greet you all with the best of greetings. Peace be upon you. Fifty years ago, women were not allowed to run. Do you know why? Anybody? Because people thought that our reproductive organs would fall out of our bodies. <laughs> I kid you not. I can assure you that my reproductive organs are well intact. <laughs> Catherine Switzer had to dress like a man in order to run the most prestigious and the oldest marathon in the nation, the Boston Marathon. She was attacked by the race director because they discovered that it was actually a woman that was running. And her boyfriend had to protect her. But she finished that marathon as the first woman to cross the finish line back in 1967. She paved the way for women in the marathon field, much like how I hope to shatter stereotypes and break barriers for covered Muslim women in the marathoning field as well. I met her when I had the honor to run the Boston Marathon back in 2017. I had actually fundraised for Syrian refugees. It was a crisis back in, in Michigan, my home state of Michigan. And when I had the honor, the invitation to run Boston, I said to myself, I have to give back because running and charity go hand in hand. I had to give back to the running community what the running gave me. I, and my initial campaign was $5,000, and it just spread like wildfire after I initiated it. I ended up raising over $16,000 in three months. Back in 2009, I, was a, I, I am and was a stay-at-home mom, suffering from postpartum blues. With three kids to raise, sometimes the mother can feel lonely. She can feel unfulfilled. What's my purpose here on life? I know I'm raising three amazing kids, but what do I have for me? Everybody else in my circle was moving up the ladder. And I kept asking myself, well, when is it my turn? What kind of a difference am I going to make in the world? But I knew that I had a longing in me, a desire to prove so, to prove myself that I can do what I set my mind to. A longing desire to accomplish and to go out there in the world and make a name for myself. I didn't know what that passion was at the time, but I knew I had to pursue something. They say patience is a virtue. God had big plans for me. I started going to the gym not to look good or to lose weight, but to have some me time and to think. And quite frankly, they offered babysitting services at the gym, and how could I not go? <laughs> so slowly, I started getting a natural high. They say that exercise is like a mood lifting, is a miracle drug. It actually lifts your mood and it reduces your stress hormones, which are adrenaline and cortisol. My son's school participated in a race, and the teacher came up to me and said, Rav, I know you're really into fitness. Why don't you come and race with us? And I said, me? No. I hated running in school. Back in middle school, I used to skip gym class just so that I don't have to run. I know. It's crazy. But then I participated in my first race, a 10-kilometer race. And it was 2012 at the time, and, you know, I crossed the finish line, and I felt like a million bucks. I felt rejuvenated. I felt reborn. I said this. This was it. This is how I'm going to make a change in the world. Especially because I was out there, and I noticed that no one else looked like me. Why is that? Runners are strong. We have a strong upper body to propel ourselves forward. We have a strong core to help us stay stable. We have strong legs that can pound the pavement 
over miles and miles and miles of training for four months of training for a marathon. But the mental, the mental part has to be extremely strong in order to run four or five hours at a time. Sometimes crossing finish lines can be so extremely hard if you don't visualize it. You have to visualize it in front of you in order to keep running. Running is about consist consistency. Fall in love with the process and you get the results, much like life. The spreading of my faith starts when I'm lining up at races. Sometimes it's 90 degrees outside and it's really, really hot and I'm covered from head to toe and everybody's just in their shorts and tank tops and I'm really, it's really obvious when I'm standing there all covered. So sometimes I'll get, you know, inquisitive looks or side eye glares and I, it, you know, it, it just occurred to me, it dawned on me that this is my purpose. My purpose is to shatter stereotypes about covered Muslim women. There was one day that I was sitting at home wondering what my next move was. I mean, I ran a few marathons. I did, you know, a few half marathons. I said to myself, well, what's next? An ad popped up at me. It was from Runner's World magazine, which is like the vogue of all running magazines. And it said, hey, do you want to be on the cover of Runner's World magazine? Well, enter this contest, and you can be on their cover. And I was like, heck yeah, I'm entering. So right away, I entered. I registered. I submitted everything. And it gained national attention. Why? Because out of thousands and thousands of entries, I was the only Muslim-covered runner. And ultimately, I came out as top 10 finalists. Thank you. Unfortunately, I did not win this contest, and I did not get on the cover of this magazine, but I was featured in their December and January issue at the time. But that loss, was the greatest thing that could have ever happened to me in my life. That was the stepping stone for what was going to come next. That reignited the fire in me to keep going, much like running a marathon when you just want to stop and quit. You have to dig really, really deep inside of you, and like I said, you have to visualize the finish line. See, when I'm surrounded by magazines that look like this in America, how can I ever make it on the cover of a magazine? I mean, sex will always sell, okay? Me, I'm not going to compete with that, and I don't want to. The thing is, is that the mentality is that if you have it, you have to flaunt it. Religious modesty is viewed as being oppressed. Only 55% of Americans have... 55% of Americans have an unfavorable view of women who cover. Only one in seven Americans actually know a Muslim. So me being out there as a physical representation of my religion is a profound statement. Sometimes I don't even have to say a word, and I'm just visually right there. Hijab is being stigmatized for ignorance and oppression. But there is nothing more empowering than the woman who gets to control who sees her beauty. Challenging, challenging those misconceptions that people have about who I am as a Muslim woman is, is actually pretty liberating. But they, they call me words like being oppressed. And I'm like, no, it's actually my choice to wear this. I'm not covering my brain, I'm covering my hair. There's a quote by Steve Jobs, who actually happens to be Syrian as well. The people who are crazy enough to think that they can change the world are the ones who usually do. The cover, the loss of that cover of the Runner's World magazine, I told you, has reignited a lot in me. It charged me up to keep pursuing my dream and not give up. I was combating Islamophobia and bigotry in a negative political environment. One day, I logged on to Instagram and I said, you know what, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get, a, to get that cover of a magazine, whatever fitness magazine it is, but I need to make a statement. So just one day, I went on into a 
magazine and their Instagram, I logged on and I wrote a comment under their Instagram and I said, hey, you guys, you know, it's really great that you're featuring lots of people on your cover from different kinds of backgrounds and beliefs. What about if you featured a covered Muslim woman? Wouldn't that be crazy? And they responded back right away and they said, Rahaf, email us. We want to hear your story. And I was like, what? So I emailed them and then they said, we're very interested in your story, but we're going to feature you in the magazine, not the cover, as one of the top 20 game changers in the nation, changing the name, changing the narrative about running and marathoning. And I said, okay, cool. That's what I said, you know, it's a step forward. It's not what I wanted, but, you know. They emailed me the next day. They said, you know what? We want you on the cover. I graced the cover of Women's Running magazine one month before Trump was elected into office. <laughs> I told you guys, God works in mysterious ways. I don't know. So I received some racist backlash. People writing me, telling me to go blow myself up. People telling me to go back where I came from. Buddy, 82% of Americans, Arabs, are U.S. citizens. People telling me to go ahead and remove my hijab. Amongst all those racist <sighs> messages, I received messages of love from strangers all around the world. The cover received national and international headlines. Breaking stereotypes and barriers starts by regular people at the local level. That means all of you sitting here in the audience. What are you going to do to contribute to society? What are you going to do with your voice? To your, how are you going to change the narrative in your respective communities? How are you going to use your passion as a vehicle for social change? Thank you. <laughs>